Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so good morning. So today I give a different kind of lecture. Yesterday was more about foundations and general principles, and today is more about recent results. And so I would like to show you some uh, results from recent experiments about subseasonal variability and teleconnections that we have performed at DCMWF, and <clears throat> together with this colleague of mine, Sarah Jane Loxis, Robert Reti Senam, and Frederick Vitar. And um, some of them are experiments on the sub, really on the subseasonal time scale, monthly ensemble predictions. And some of them are long runs, multi decadal runs, uh, with both just our atmospheric system forced by observed SST or with our coupled system. And these are experiments that we've run for a EU funded project called Primavera, which is coordinated by the UK Met Office and University of Reading. Um, and uh, it, it involves making uh, long simulations for the historical period and the future up to 2050. CMWF will only do uh, the historical part. So let's start from uh, the subseasonal experiment. Um, well, you've already seen a diagram like this many times. Um, but uh, in fact, I uh, will come back to show you this particular um, version of the Wheeler and Hendon uh, phase diagram uh, because it just describes one case of a uh, very strong Madeleine Julian oscillation that occurred uh, during uh, the winter 2007-2008. So, um, you see here, you know, a very, very large amplitude uh, of the MJO cycle, especially uh, in this part of the diagram, uh, phase two and three, where the convection is uh, located uh, over uh, the Indian Ocean. And uh, so basically these experiments were uh, concerned with one particular aspect, and that is, um, you know, we always say, well, we, you know, it's been said a number of times during the school, um, we have this signal that propagates into the extra tropics with a time scale of, say, 10 days. And most people would say uh, the largest connection with the North Atlantic oscillation occurs 10 days after phase three. However, uh, the MJO is a propagating phenomenon, um, and therefore, um, because of that, when you do lag correlation, there's always some sort of uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. For example, you could say, well, let's see what happens 15 days after phase two, when the convection is in Western Indian Ocean. And if you do that, and uh, you make a composite of all the geopotential height anomalies at 500 uh, kilopascal, um, 15 days after phase two, uh, then you get a map like this uh, with this wave number two that we have already seen and discussed yesterday, and you see a positive North Atlantic oscillation signal. Now, if you do the composite 10 days after phase three, you get a similar wave number two, perhaps this center might be a bit less defined, but now the southern part of the North Atlantic Oscillation is stronger. So actually you can put them together and, and then you get a, a more sort of smoother uh, teleconnection pattern, which however is not very different from any of, of the two. So the question is, um, where is the signal actually starting from? And how long does it take? Or maybe this is what we could say is that uh, what we see uh, in the North Atlantic is actually a combination of signals that come from different parts of the Indian Ocean, but have different propagation time, and they, then they end up reinforcing each other. So these were the questions that we uh, were trying to address. And of course, they've been addressed in the past. And um, one simple way to do that, and that is similar to what you are doing with Speedy, or when you fix the location of, of the forcing, is in fact to <coughs> impose a diabatic heating uh, 
uh, in one part of the tropics uh, in a general circulation model of the atmosphere and, uh, and then see what is the response and how long it takes uh, for the response to be established. And one uh, paper which is often quoted uh, on this is the one from uh, uh, Hylin uh, Gilbert Bonnet and, and, and a collaborator there, uh, published in 2010, where they actually took uh, a dry primitive equation model with prescribed heating, and they added on top of the climatological heating some anomalous heating that somehow was mimicking the structure of the first two uh, EOFs of OLR variability. And they didn't get uh, uh, a lot of response from the first pattern, the monopole over the maritime continent. Uh, but they got a pretty strong response to dipole uh, here. And um, the maps uh, at the bottom are, uh, in fact, the response in geopotential height at 500 uh, after 6 to 10 days uh, after the start of the um, forcing. And then you see that there you, um, yeah, I hope you see the coastlines here is North America. So they get some strong response in, in the Pacific, let's say from day six to day 10. And then after another five days, so 11 to 15, uh, then they also get this response uh, uh, in the Atlantic that projects onto the North Atlantic oscillation. So may I just point out that Contrary to the observed composite on the list, and I think you can also see the that we get a huge response in the Pacific, which I think is kind of intuitively probably expected. But then in the North Atlantic, if you scale it, it's probably it's just one, not even a third of that, fourth of yeah. that from the Pacific, which is not the case in that way. No, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that this is, I'm not saying that this is a, a, a a perfect explanation of what's happening, but it's a paper which is often quoted and it has a relatively simple methodology. And um, also what they have done, and it's quite nice, um, they've actually made a number of experiments, again, with the dipole uh, structure, but moving the, uh, the longitude uh, of, of the centers. And so, um, and then they look whether the signal actually basically projected on this pattern in a positive way or a negative way. So um, in that particular experiment, the, um, the center of the heating is, uh, um, is about 90 degrees. Um, so basically, this graph tells you that uh, wherever you put the center of the heating west of uh, 100 deg degrees longitude, you will get uh, a projection with this sign, uh, when you move it to the east, uh, at the sign of the response will change. And although, as Fred pointed out, the details of this response may be um, slightly different from, from reality, uh, the general features have been reproduced by many others. Um, one issue with this kind of technique is that, well, in the MJO case, the heating is not fixed, it's actually propagating. And so other studies have actually imposed the propagating heating. And there's a very nice study uh, by David and collaborators published uh, recently in 2015, uh, where uh, a forcing that was actually diagnosed uh, from uh, actual data was uh, imposed as a moving forcing, and, and they studied the uh, extratropical response. So somehow, when you're using speedy with this propagating forcing, you are somehow doing something along, along this line. Now, um, I showed you this, this uh, graph before. Somehow, the, these teleconnections are not very uh, dissimilar to the ones that we also found on the seasonal time scale. So if you actually look at the uh, teleconnection from a dipole uh, in, in convection between the Western Indian Ocean and the maritime continents, then you, uh, again, you see this wave number two pattern with this slow extension here, north of, of the Caspian Sea. Um, so again, uh, this is a, a confirmation that if you have a heating dipole, 
uh, in, in that region that will produce uh, this pattern. One difference between this pattern and the previous one, if you notice, is, is the sign of the uh, of the signal in the Pacific, and that, uh, in fact, that depends very much on on the location because if you if you move this dipole too far uh, to the east, then the, the negative part will actually go into into the Central Pacific, and then you will get um, a different kind of, of, of response, a bit like a La Nina response that will give you a high over over the, the Pacific. So the, the sign of the Pacific response may also depend crucially on where the, uh, the uh, dipole is actually located. Can you imagine? Uh, I mean, uh, because when I see this picture, I think people have probably commented on the, the radio or something like that. Can you imagine that the radio is probably commented on the radio? I mean, the largest signal I see is in the Central Pacific. So why do you claim that the signal is coming from the Indian Ocean region? Um, there's another <laughs> figure in the paper where I remove the ENSO signal. Yeah, on, on, if you do it on the seasonal time scale, you would, um, okay, I don't have it here because I didn't want to put too many slides. But uh, if you orthogonalize this signal, so you can take an index like this, you, you take the Nino 3.4 SST, and you orthogonalize the signal. So you remove the component. Then this blob goes away. And you, uh, my assumption is that you remove the, say, in the Pacific, you get a reduced amplitude? And in the Pacific, you get a reduced amplitude. However, it doesn't, it doesn't go a away. If you, if you locate the, the convection enough to, to the west, it still gives you um, a negative signal over the Pacific. But yeah, the, the, the strength of this is actually related to this part as well. It's not only, it's not only. No, these are, uh, this is uh, ERA interim, geopotential height, and GPCP. So these are, these are observations. Now, um, so I wanted to try and use this simple approach also to look at uh, different time scales. In fact, you know, the subseasonal. Um, that we are concerned today with, uh, and the decadal time scale. Now, for the decadal time scale, I don't have time to uh, talk about it here, but uh, this long link <laughs> will give you access to a similar presentation I gave at, at the ECNWF seminar in September that also covers the, uh, the decadal part. So, um, we try to uh, make uh, experiments similar to the one of Eileen or the one uh, you are doing, uh, but with a slightly different approach. And the, um, the reason is that we didn't want to explicitly impose one particular structure, because you know, as we discussed, then the response may depend exactly on what latitude and, and uh, maybe the vertical structure of the heating, whether you move it or you keep it fixed. So what we did is that we Choose one case of strong MJO, and, and this is the one I showed you before. So this one in winter, uh, 2007. And actually, so we started uh, ensemble experiments with the CMWF uh, ensemble prediction system started uh, on the 10th of December. So we are in this point in the MJO cycle. And in the uh, CMWF ensemble, we have what is called a stochastic physics, that's a sort of abbreviated term, basically. So we put stochastic perturbation to the uh, tendencies that are produced by the physical parameterizations. This scheme is referred to as SPPT, which stands for Stochastic Parameterization of Physical Tendencies. And what it does is that it takes the integrated, the total results of all the parameterizations, and then it just multiplies these tendencies by a number which is one plus a small random number. Now, in the operational ensemble, this approach is applied all over the globe. And in addition, we put initial perturbations in, in the ensemble. In this particular experiment, uh, we didn't put any perturbation in the initial condition. 
but we did basically a control experiment where the stochastic physics is applied over the globe as in the operational ensemble. So this will produce some spread, of course, smaller at the beginning, but then it will go over the whole globe. And then we looked at two particular regions, and uh, the first one is exactly uh, the one uh, that uh, we have discussed before. And, um, and the second one, and you will understand why, is this region covering South America and the tropical Atlantic. So basically what we want to see is whether if we just originate some spread in the ensemble in this region or in this region, would that be enough to modify substantially the variability in the North Atlantic? And so somehow the reason why we have chosen uh, a strong MJO case is that this forcing is stochastic. So it doesn't have a preferred structure. However, so what we hoped is that since this was a case when the convection was organizing itself, this stochastic perturbation would somehow project on the existing NJO by making either stronger or, or, or weaker. <coughs> and so uh, this is what happened. So this is uh, uh, what happens in the experiment where you have the stochastic perturbations applied everywhere. So we computed an index of the North Atlantic oscillation, just the difference between geopotential height in the region of Iceland and um, Lisbon. And uh, if you now uh, do a, a regression against this index among the 51 members of the ensemble, so in this case, the variability is just, it's not a variability in time, it's a variability among the 51 members of the ensemble. Each of them has a different perturbation. Then uh, you can see that there's quite a strong variability here in the North Atlantic. You cannot see the maximum, but it goes over 120 meters uh, over Iceland. So very strong uh, NAO variability. And then I looked at uh, precipitation. Uh, along the equator, so average between 10 north and 10 south. So this map is actually for, and it's an average for days 29 to 23. So basically, it's a five day mean center on day 21. And then I looked at five day means of precipitation backwards. And this red box just tells you that the stochastic physics is applied over the whole range of latitudes. And so basically, you, you look backward at what uh, is actually happened. And if you look at here at the beginning of the experiment, uh, then you can see an increase in rainfall uh, west of 90 degrees east and a decrease in rainfall uh, to the east. So somehow, it tells you that uh, you can actually, actually trace uh, some some signal propagating to the east. But you also see some signal here uh, over the South America and North Atlantic region. So this picture is a bit mixed, uh, but it basically tells you that so you have some signal at the beginning uh, of the experiments in two regions. Here, the uh, Indian Ocean and West Pacific, and here, the Atlantic. Somehow, this signal propagates into the uh, extra tropics, um, and then you get this NAO. However, because the perturbations are applied everywhere, you cannot be absolutely sure that uh, the spread in the NAO was only caused by, by this perturbation. However, uh, then we can look at what happened if we only, when we only put the perturbation uh, in the Indian Ocean and the maritime continent. And then somehow, of course, you do the same hof moller diagram. And so this is the area where the perturbations are put. And so you see that at the beginning, the rainfall anomaly is only present in this area, as you would expect. Again, very large spread in the North Atlantic Oscillation around day 20. And here now, you, you can clearly see, you see more clearly the signal in precipitation propagating 
uh, from uh, the Western Indian Ocean uh, to the east. So you, uh, you see this green line uh, moving from the beginning of the experiments up to day 20. So in this case, we know that the source of the spread is only in that region. There's no other source of spread in this ensemble apart from the changes in convection which are triggered by the stochastic physics. Now we can say how long does it take for this spread to be equivalent to the spread we have when we put perturbations everywhere. So for example, if you uh, now compute the spread in the NAO index, uh, this is how the spread increases with time when we put perturbations everywhere. Of course, you have perturbations already in the extra tropics, so uh, the NAO spread will, will grow quite fast. Uh, and after about 10 days, it will almost reach uh, its maximum value. If you put just the perturbations in the tropics, uh, in the Indian Ocean and, and the Indonesia, of course, at the beginning, there's hardly any spread in the NAO because the signal didn't have time to propagate. But after, you see, after about 20 days, the spread in the NAO is basically the same. So this tells you that you put a perturbation. In this case, we didn't impose any structure. We just perturb stochastic, stochastically and let the model organize itself. And basically, after, uh, after 20 days, you have a spread in the NAO as large as in the experiment where we had perturbations everywhere. So this somehow is an indication that this is really a crucial region for the variability uh, of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, of course, but of course you, you, this is mainly showing up in the subseasonal range because of course, you know, in, in the first 10 days or so, the signal is still somehow traveling. So if you put the in the Eastern Pacific, do you expect something different to happen? Uh, we also put perturbations in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, the, the problem of this experiment is that because it's random. Eventually, it doesn't matter where you put perturbations. Right? If you wait long enough, the spread of the NAO will be. Spread. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's just a matter of, of the time scale of it. Uh, well, we put perturbations in the Atlantic. That's the second region. And that is what you get. So even after 20 days, you don't get the same spread. Yeah, you, you get some spread. But if you actually look at the, um, the amplitude of what happens if we just put the perturbations here, uh, then you get something that, again, projects on the NAO. Uh, but it's probably only 60% of what, what you get. So yeah, it's true that if you wait long enough, everything will reach the same spread. But here you have to go up to day 30 to have the same spread. So if you go at day 20, which is around here, uh, while in the other case the blue line was overlapping with the green one, uh, here we are about at 2 -3. So, um, oh, of course, you know, in, in the long run, uh, any perturbation will spread to, to, the, to the whole globe. Uh, but somehow this shows that, in fact, the, the Indian Ocean and West Pacific is a particularly effective source of perturbations for the North Atlantic Oscillation. Now, of course, this is not a general methodology. It probably will not work in all the cases. I think it worked because this was a case of strong MJO, so the stochastic forcing actually was amplified by uh, the strong organized convection, and we'll have to repeat want to repeat this experiment uh, in other, uh, for other initial states uh, to see what happens. Now, um, yeah, another, another way of, of seeing this is to instead start from the precipitation and to do the covariance with some lag. That's the traditional approach. For example, if you do it using a GPCP and ERA interim, uh, in fact, you put a dipole exactly when same region uh, as we use for the seasonal forecast. And after two weeks, uh, uh, you see, again, this wave number two um, in the northern extra tropics. Now, if you do it uh, uh, with the experiment, 
uh, in fact, with these perturbations only uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, then of course, if you do the covariance across the ensemble member, at lag zero, you hardly see anything because the signal has not yet reached the extratropics. Then you start seeing something uh, after one week, uh, again, wave number two, and this wave number two then becomes fully developed uh, after two weeks. Now let me move to, to uh, the second part, and we now, so this is basically how we can uh, trigger uh, NAO variability in our subseasonal forecast. Now, when you do subseasonal forecast, of course, we start with observed initial conditions, so the model is still, basically starts from the observed attractor, but of course models have biases and they asymptote to uh, their own climate. And uh, <clears throat> so we decided to take part into this uh, EU-funded project, uh, Primavera, which is basically, the goal is to uh, diagnose the behavior of uh, high resolution uh, couple models and to basically develop improvement in different aspects uh, of, of this model. Um, this is a project that involves all the major modeling groups in Europe and will contribute to the so-called high-res MIP uh, part of CMIP-6. So high-res MIP is uh, basically mm, it's consists in a set of simulations for the period 1950 to 2050. So this will be uh, 100 year runs. And you will have a control experiment with 1950 forcing. You will have coupled experiment. And for the historical part, you will have a MIP experiment. Now, ECMWF is only doing the historical part, so we are not doing the extension. So our experiments are performed up to, from 1950 to 2014. And since the purpose of the, uh, of the project is to explore the impact of resolution, every institution uh, runs the simulations with two resolutions. In this case, uh, basically, we are running uh, with uh, two versions of our couple model, one uh, with a sort of grid point resolution of 50 kilometers and one with a grid point resolution of 25 kilometers. Uh, in one case, the ocean model has a one degree resolution, in the other case, it's a quarter of a degree resolution. The vertical resolution is identical, 91 levels for the atmosphere, 75 levels uh, in, uh, in the ocean, and we use the LIM2 uh, sea ice model in both cases. So the first thing, uh, this was a new kind of experiment for us, basically running our model for a very long time to see what is actually the asymptotic climate of the model. So I think one of the first things that you, you uh, want to see when you run a uh, coupled system is whether it's able to maintain uh, ENSO variability. And this was uh, a nice surprise for us that the model actually does. Uh, so uh, these are actually time series of the Nino 3.4 SST anomaly. Uh, on the left, you see what you get in the AMIP. Of course, in the AMIP, you prescribe the SST. So these are actually the head I SST2. So in practice, these are the observations of, of SST. Um, and these are the time series for four ensemble members run with the coupled uh, high resolution run. And uh, we our nice surprise, uh, the system was ab is able to, to maintain ENSO amplitude. Uh, you can see that the things look a bit different between different ensemble members. For example, in this one, you have pretty large amplitudes with quite regular period. Uh, but if you look at the other experiments, then the variation is more uh, regular, perhaps closer to the observation. And uh, there will be, uh, each group will contribute uh, one ensemble member, that is the requirement, this will be put in the CMOR format that is common, will be common to all CMIP-6 experiments, and in this particular case you will get this ensemble member for. Um, it probably is good because I think the, it's somewhat in the middle between uh, the other uh, ensemble members. So that's a nice experiment, and not only you can do the uh, the 
covariance of uh, SST in the top or rainfall uh, at the bottom with the uh, Nino, in this case will be the Nino 4 SST anomaly because we wanted also to look at precipitation that peaks in the Nino 4. Uh, and you have on the left the, um, the covariance is computed from ERA interim and GPCP. In the center, the covariance is computed by Amy. And here um, on the right, the covariance is computed from uh, the coupled model. And if you compare these covariance with the absurd ones, these are, re honestly, these are really good. Uh, one aspect I will, I'm actually coming back is that if you look at the covariance between the rainfall here and the rainfall in the Indian Ocean, you see a pretty small signal in the observation. So this tells you that the rainfall here and the rainfall here, have a, they have a positive correlation, but it's relatively weak. It gets a bit stronger in the AMIP run, and it gets even stronger in the couple runs. And I will show you what effect this has on the teleconnections. So these are now the, the teleconnections from the Western Indian Ocean and the Nino 4 region, the precipitation in this region, on the geopotential height at 500, and these are actually seasonal means in this case. We first look at the seasonal means. Top left, what you get from the observation, the usual wave number two, we have seen the number of times. Why? If you, so this is from the Western Indian Ocean. And it, it, you see, if you only do the Western Indian Ocean, then you get this low over the North Pacific, but it's much reduced and farther to, to, to the north. So the big signal that you saw in the previous version is also because I, I included in the index the sinking of the maritime continent. But the part over the North Atlantic oscillation, you can get it just if you consider the rainfall over the Western Indian. If you look at the, instead at the, um, covariance with the Nino 4 precipitation, then you get the traditional um, El Nino uh, teleconnection, a big signal here uh, over the Central and East uh, Pacific, and a signal over the Atlantic where you have a big low roughly in the middle. Actually, you can say that there's maybe a slight negative projection onto the North Atlantic uh, oscillation because you have a positive anomaly here over Iceland. But if you look, for example, over Lisbon, it's around the zero line. So it's a very weakly, weak negative um, correlation. Now, let's look at what the model does. If we look at the Amy runs, well, there's a wave number two pattern uh, in geopotential height, um, not as clear. Uh, not as strong as in the observation, especially the southern part is much weaker. But overall, you could say it's not too bad. If you look at the El Nino one, the also looks pretty good in the Pacific. But now, um, well, you, you see that there, there's a shift to the north of this, uh, of this particular uh, pattern. So, uh, now you, you, you tend to get perhaps a slightly positive uh, connection with, uh, uh, with the NAO. We still argue that the, like the relevant flow pattern in Europe is still very similar. Only that, okay, one yeah. projects more on the NAO, the other a little bit less, but the flow in the yeah. Atlantic and in Europe is more or less yeah. similar. Now, if you now look at the coupled system, then perhaps the, yeah, this particular teleconnection here in the Atlantic, it perhaps gets more similar. Now the, the, the position of, of the low is, uh, in this case, it, it's actually farther to, to the south. So in this case, the, the, the projection is more clearly negative on the NAO. But look at what happens from the Indian Ocean. You hardly have any, um, any signal. And it's interesting to see how that depends on the relationship between these two uh, regions. So we see in the observations, they are not very much correlated. So I've plotted here for the four ensemble members, the correlation of the uh, Western Indian Ocean rainfall with the Nino 3.4 uh, SST. These are the red dots. The observation gives you 0 0.17. So 
the red line should roughly be at the same level as the red number. But actually, uh, these are the aim runs, uh, and these are the couple runs. You see, all the points are much higher. Now, the second thing that you can plot is the uh, correlation. These are the green values of the Western Indian Ocean rainfall with the NAO index. And if you look at the AMIP, yeah, the green line, the green dots are a bit below the 0 0.34 values that you get from the observation, but they are not very far apart, consistent with the maps. But if you actually look um, at the uh, at the couple runs, well, they are very low or even, in one case, even, even negative. Now, interestingly, let's look at what happens to the um, correlation between the Nino 3.4 SST and the NAO index. We have seen that in the reality is almost zero, in fact, minus 0 .0 0 0.05. So, yeah, negative, but really very, very small. Um, and more or less, the AMIP does it right. But as we have seen from the maps, <coughs> the couple models tends to do actually <coughs> a stronger negative correlation. So because these two regions actually tend to send op opposite or at least orthogonal signal in the, um, in the North Atlantic, what happens in our couple system is that actually, first of all, from the El Nino region, we get a slightly negative NAO. And then not only, but the El Nino region is very strongly correlated now, it's rather strongly correlated with the Western Indian Ocean. So somehow you, you correlate two regions and send an opposite signal on the North Atlantic, and this signal uh, basically cancel uh, each other. So this is what happens on the seasonal time scale. Now we, uh, then I try to look at the, um, at the sub-seasonal time scale. And I did a similar analysis as I showed you uh, before. In this case, I used OLR just for a technical issue. Uh, in the observations, you get basically the same uh, results. This is actually a slightly longer period than I showed you before. I used the full era interim uh, period, 1980 to 2013. Um, again, uh, covariance with the dipole in OLR. In this case, convection means negative OLR anomaly and subsidence is associated with positive OLR anomaly over the maritime continent. And uh, okay, after, after two weeks, uh, again, you see this, uh, it's not, in this case, it's more connected, but okay, you have lows over uh, this region, roughly the Bering Strait, lows uh, negative over Iceland, positive over the Mediterranean, so clearly, you know, a positive uh, NAO signal. Now, in the Pran. Well, again, uh, you get the wave number two and the, this negative extension towards the Caspian Sea. Um, if you do it from the couple, you, you would hardly see anything. However, as I said, sometimes this correlation may depend critically on the location of the dipole. So what I did is that uh, this is probably more of a, a phase two of the NAO. What happens if I shift the dipole uh, to the east uh, to be closer to a phase three? And in fact, if you do that, it's not that you get a fantastic signal, but at least you start getting some projection onto uh, a positive uh, NAO. Now, you can ask yourself, why does it happen? Well, one reason is maybe on the seasonal time scale, we have seen that this, this strong, stronger control of the uh, ENSO region. But in this case, the ENSO signal is actually removed. So all the signals are orthogonalized to uh, ENSO. So there may be another reason for that. And what, you, what we actually found out is that we wanted to see how the OLR signal was actually propagating in this experiment. So, uh, again, we start from uh, um, an OLR signal roughly looking like a phase uh, two of the NAO, and we want to see what happens after two weeks. So then you would expect this signal to propagate to the east. <coughs> so this is what happens if you do it with the era interim uh, OLR. 
So you start from a phase two, and in fact, after two weeks, now the convection has moved into the west. Uh, sorry, so this is a dry area, so the dry area has moved uh, into the West Pacific, uh, and the, uh, the negative OLR anomaly, which represents convection, uh, has also moved from the Western Indian Ocean to the Eastern Indian Ocean. So maybe something like a phase three or a phase four. Yeah. No, no, no. In this case, uh, now these are uh, sorry. These are now s weekly means. Oh, okay. These are now weekly means. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, you you compute this index from uh, uh, a certain week and you correlate this with the week, the anomalies one week after or two weeks after. So, so basically, um, let's, let's, so this is what you get uh, after two weeks if you, um, if you do it from uh, the reanalysis. This is what you get uh, if you look at the AMIP. And if you look at the AMIP, you see a signal which is as strong as the observation, but you, you can hardly see any propagation. The signal is almost standing. So there's a bit of propagation, but very low. And that's probably the effect of the imposition of, of prescribed SST. So you actually, you don't allow the feedback with the ocean, which are known to be contributing to the propagation of uh, the Madeline Union oscillation. So basically, the, the covariance map with this signal after one week, sorry, at, no, at week zero, and then after two weeks, shows very little sign of, of propagation. So the, the signal remains standing, or it's weakly propagating. And uh, you, you can read this nice paper by Priyanka, Yaram, and, and David, where they actually show that uh, actually slow episodes are actually the ones that give the stronger teleconnections in the, uh, in the North Atlantic. So somehow, it seems that also our Remy plans tend to keep the forcing in place for, for a longer time. And this is probably, again, another factor that makes the teleconnection stronger. They have the variance. Uh, the problem is that we haven't yet, we, we have to do actually the lag correlation to see what is the speed of propagation. This would suggest that the speed extremely is extremely low. Now, if you look at the coupled model, um, maybe you can say that now the phase is the right one, but look how weak is, is, is the signal. So this would actually suggest that in, the, in our coupled system, there's not really a coherent propagation. Because although the variance, if you do these things in other positions, you get the same result. The variance is, is very comparable with the observation. But the lag, so when you do uh, a correlation at zero lag, but when you look at what happens after two weeks, then you almost uh, lose any, any signal. So this seems to indicate that the, the, the propagation is much less coherent in the model uh, than it is uh, in the observation. Therefore, while in the Amy plan you have this signal that is, remains in the same place for quite a long time, uh, in the couple run, um, there's actually very little coherence in, in, in the propagation of this anomaly. And so somehow the signal uh, probably uh, interfere with with each other, uh, possibly in a destructive way. It's not. It's not bad in. Yeah, in in the sense that if you look at the yeah the location of, of the anomalies is is roughly the right one. 
if you look at the amplitude, uh, uh, because this is actually an, a nonlinear scale, uh, you probably have something like half of, of the amplitude. So, for example, here you have a contour of three. Uh, in the same area, you have a contour of six. Uh, and again, uh, here, the, these three, uh, this contour of three get this signal. And here, you have a contour of, of one. So, yeah, in this case, so it seems that overall, the average propagation speed is probably the right one. But the fact that you lose so much signal to me, it indicates that there's a lot of spread in, in the propagation. It's not that everything dies out, because if I, if I, move, if I move these boxes, the, the variance at leg zero is still high. But it's when you do this lag correlation, that then you lose a lot of signal. So to me, this indicates that on average, the system has the right propagation, but with a lot of spread. So uh, you don't have a, a coherent movement of this uh, organized convection in, in, in the couple system. Anyway, these are really just very new results. The data have just been delivered. Um, and therefore, uh, hopefully, you will see uh, many more results from the Primavera runs uh, uh, in, in, in the future. So we'll, we'll have another two years to analyze uh, these ones. So, um, so a brief summary. So uh, we have seen that we can actually <coughs> basically reproduce the propagation of the signal from uh, the Western Indian Ocean and the maritime continents in sub-seasonal experiments just by basically adding stochastic perturbations to the physics. And we have seen that, in fact, the Indian Ocean and the maritime continent are very effective in uh, generating the spread. But propagation time is two weeks to 10 days. So it's very relevant for the sub-seasonal time scale, perhaps less so for the early medium range. We have looked now for the first time in very long runs with our couple system and in parallel with AMIP system. So there is a mixture of good news and, and, and uh, bad news. Uh, good news is that we have a, a realistic simulation of ENSO variability and the teleconnections. But we have problems with reproducing the teleconnections uh, from uh, the Indian Ocean on both the seasonal and the subseasonal time scales. And there are two reasons. One is, is a stronger dependence of Indian Ocean rainfall on uh, the ENSO SSTs. Uh, and the other one is that it seems that um, in our couple system, the, the propagation speed uh, is uh, less well defined somehow uh, than uh, in observation. So in the observation, you get a more coherent propagation. Uh, in the couple model, uh, on average, it's right, but probably with a lot of variability, and therefore the average signal uh, um, gets weaker. So, um, so it seems that there are a lot of ingredients that you have to get right to get this, uh, these teleconnections. You need to have the, correct, the convection in the right place. You need to have the right amplitude, of course. Uh, but you also need to have the right propagation and the right connection uh, with ENSO. So uh, it's not a very simple, there's not a very simple recipe. Uh, to get these, these teleconnections, and uh, a number of things have to get right. And so when you see, for example, uh, Federic Vitares computer maps of teleconnections for many S2S models, and uh, you might be a bit depressed in, in saying that all the models get a weaker teleconnection than uh, in the reality. Uh, but as, as you have seen, you have to get a lot of things right uh, to get, <laughs> to get this, this teleconnection. So, Still a lot of work to do on, on the modeling side. Thank you.